Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is uh, Stu Wilson. I'm the CEO of Radical. Radical provides insights that helps the world's leading companies better understand startups, new markets, and the future of their markets by sourcing powerful perspectives from market participants. We tap into the expertise of founders, former employees, investors, and other stakeholders to enable better decision making with respect to everything from incubating new businesses and partnering with startups to solve business challenges to ultimately making investments and acquisitions. Today, we're partnering with our friends, Alan Goldstein, Managing Director of P&G Ventures and Suna Stilling, Head of Growth for Maersk, to share their perspectives on innovation and investing in the future when the present is so uncertain. Uh, this webinar is part of a series we've launched to help innovation and future-facing professionals better navigate the coming months. Uh, the next one we'll be doing is on startup and tech technology mergers and acquisitions, and it'll be later in May, so keep an eye out. Uh, P&G, as many of you know, is the biggest consumer goods company in the world, uh, while Maersk's transportation and logistics network um, controls approximately 20% of seaborne consumer goods, everything from apparel through autos. Both companies have long histories of risk-taking and innovation, uh, and both Suna and Alan have seen the ups and downs of uh, multiple economic cycles. I'll let uh, Alan and Suna introduce themselves, um, but quickly, uh, I believe they're uniquely positioned uh, in both their career experiences to date, um, from launching new products like Swiffer, um, to running international businesses uh, in places like Egypt, uh, to share their thoughts with you, answer your questions, uh, and ultimately brainstorm on how to navigate the next months uh, while still focusing on, uh, on the future. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we begin. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. Um, I'll bring them up during the presentation and we'll also have time, uh, or during our Q&A, and we'll have also have time for questions at the end. Um, and I'll also launch an anonymous poll um, once uh, we begin and uh, share uh, the results with you. It will be uh, a bit of a temperature check on uh, how you're responding and how your organizations are responding uh, to the environment. Uh, it's anonymous, uh, and so hopefully we'll collect some uh, interesting information. Uh, lastly, a recording of this webinar and the presentation will be available to all registrants. Um, I will send you a note with it uh, tomorrow. Uh, and so without further ado, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, Alan and Tuna, uh, you both have taken interesting paths to your current roles. Uh, before we get into what you're doing today with P&G Ventures and Maersk Growth, uh, can you both give us a bit of a sense of your background and how you ended up here? And maybe, Alan, you can start. Thanks, Stu. Appreciate it. So morning for people on the West Coast, afternoon and good evening. Um, thanks for joining us. And Stu, again, thanks for the opportunity. So I'm Alan Goldstein. Um, I'm with Procter & Gamble. I'm specifically with an organization called um, P&G Ventures, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, long history in the innovation space. Um, about 29 years at P&G, working um, almost all business units, um, with the exception of our baby care business, um, Pampers, and um, our femme care business. Those two I have not worked. Um, but have had some pretty amazing um, opportunities, as well as my, um, my share of failures. Um, some of the highlights certainly is being part of kind of Swiffer, Febreze, Magic Eraser. Um, and some of the low points probably are car washes, wireless charging, um, et cetera. Um, kind of an entrepreneur at heart, even though I work for a big co. Um, and very, very passionate about um, startups and entrepreneurs and the collaboration between big co's and um, small enterprises. Great. Uh, and Suna, uh, a bit of uh, your background, which has taken you around the world. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for having us too. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Suna Stilling, I'm, uh, I'm the head of growth for Maersk. So for all sort of intents and purposes, I'm, uh, I'm the managing partner of, 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 of Maersk Growth, sort of a very similar setup, although you'll probably also hear a bit about some differences uh, throughout the session between what what Alan is doing at, at, at P&G and what we're what we doing at Maersk. Um, so we started the Maersk growth journey about three years ago, um, but I've been with, uh, with Maersk for a bit more than, uh, than, than 20 years. 
um, before doing what I'm doing today, I sort of been in, in general management uh, across most of our business units, spending a fair bit of time within uh, our oil and gas business when, uh, before we divested of that. Uh, pretty much all over the world, uh, corporate level, regional level, country level, and as mentioned, uh, across business units. The last 10 of which have been typically around managing director CEO level positions in some typically rather uh, radical turnaround situations, uh, whether commercially, uh, operationally, financially, or, or a bit of both, and also typically with an, an M&A transaction at either end of uh, of, uh, of, of, of my tenure. Um, and I think similar to, 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 to Alan, uh, I'm also an, an entrepreneur at heart, uh, despite, as you said, uh, being with, uh, with a corporate. Um, I did some more entrepreneurial stuff early on in my career before, uh, before joining MERS, but, uh, but I've also, I mean, had some fantastic opportunities the last two decades. So, uh, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, Suna, when we spoke earlier this year, you talked about how Maersk growth had grown out of Maersk's 115 year history of risk taking. Can you talk a little bit about what is Maersk growth, um, what its focus is, and also what makes it unique? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we, as, as mentioned, we started this, uh, this, this journey three years ago now um, as part of a larger corporate uh, reorg um, and sort of where we, we focus focused uh, our conglomerate to becoming a focused transportation and logistics company. And as part of that, we've divested around $15 billion of, of revenue coming from the energy businesses that I used to be with, uh, with in the past. And uh, when our CEO, Saren, um, took over as CEO and in mid-16, he gave me a call and said, well, despite divesting of our energy businesses, we will want to be a growth company. And he sort of laid out three levers for that. Uh, one, organic growth another one sort of traditional corporate M&A, large scale M&A activities, and then sort of what he called adjacent growth. And that's essentially what was the birth of Maersk growth, sort of addressing that adjacent growth challenge for AP Muller Maersk uh, and finding a way to sort of create long-term value for, for, for our customers and, 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 uh, and, and for the company internally as well. Um, We've been experimenting a lot. We've been pivoting a lot. We've been failing a lot over the last, the last three years. But fast forwarding uh, to 17, 18, and 19, today, I and my team spend 75 to 80% of our time on venture investing, so corporate venture capital. Most uh, months, we see around 100 companies within the greater supply chain realm and typically end up investing in one of those. Over the last 24 months, we build a portfolio of 21, 22 companies. And then we also still have the intent to build companies uh, and or partner with, the, with, with startups with sort of the overall aim of, of creating value for our customers and for creating long-term uh, strategic assets for, for Maersk. Great. And Alan, you've been, as you noted in your introduction, part of some of the greatest consumer product inventions and P&G has a long history of innovation also. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about P&G Ventures and it isn't what people may think it is um, and what role it plays in inventing P&G's future? Yeah, so, you know, P&G, you know, a large, pretty large company. We touch about 5 billion consumers every day. So we have kind of pretty amazing reach. Um, since probably the Swiffer and Febreze days, so, you know, the early to mid 2000s, um, the company really hasn't created any new brands, right? And we've been really highly focused on the core, um, which has been going well. Um, P&G Ventures was put into place about five years ago with our mission really to establish new brands or new businesses that have billion dollar or unicorn potential that are outside of the core of what the company does today. So we're looking for new opportunities and new businesses. Um, we're not an investment arm of the company though. Um, we realize that for us, capital is not a differentiator, um, but we're really in service of entrepreneurs. So our uh, model is really, you know, what's the best of the big co with the best of a startup or an entrepreneur to really create very unique and superior solutions um, to consumer pain points. So we do that in a variety of different ways um, with a variety of different um, partnerships. 
Um, importantly, each partnership is different, right? Because everybody's on a different point of their journey. Um, but we're really about establishing new businesses and new brands. Since our conception about five years ago, um, we've stood up three businesses currently, three new brands. Um, they're small. We kind of think of them as our uh, children who are at boarding school, um, growing them up um, with a pipeline behind that of a variety of others. Awesome. Uh, maybe before we get into the current environment, we can talk a little bit about um, how your um, you know, groups approach investing in the future. And maybe we could talk a little bit about balancing the needs uh, to invest in the future with um, the near-term needs of shareholders and organizations uh, to grow uh, today. Um, and that, that was a challenge uh, for big companies, you know, six months ago, um, perhaps even more so now. Um, how, how do you balance those two things uh, while still focusing on the future? Maybe Suna first. Yeah, thank you, Stu. And I think, you know, Alan, you make a very good point, if I can just quickly comment on that, that, that clearly, you know, I, I think capital is not a differentiator. Well, maybe right now it is, but at least three, four months ago, it, uh, it, it wasn't so, uh, so much, right? I think as a, as a corporate or strategic investor, you certainly have to bring, you know, something, something different than, than, than capital. I mean, we call that that rocket fuel, and I think sort of most sort of successful uh, setups like like ours have have something uh, something similar. Um, I think I've been uh, and and we've been very fortunate from from the inception, right? I, I don't think it's any you know any secret that sort of a lot of you know corporates, and I think sort of there's different sort of terminology for this, but but everything from you know the empire strikes back to uh, you know that the sort of body wants to get rid of all the antibodies and, and, and that whole concept, right? That when something new and something strange pops up on the side or in the, in the core for corporate, then sort of the establishments want to kill it, right? And, and I think that's human nature. And I think sort of that goes across most corporates. So I think when we set up shop, um, our CEO used to talk about giving us air cover. Um, and initially, I didn't really appreciate what that was or the importance of that. Um, but I think sort of, you know, three years later, I, I certainly see the value of that, right? And, and that, of course, you know, in, 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 in most corporates, you know, people are not allowed the luxury to sit and think about what happens in a year, three years, five years, 10 years from now, right? It's about delivering results today, tomorrow, this week, this quarter. Uh, and and that's, that's essentially the drumbeat that corporates run at. Um, and, and of course, sort of in, in the current times, I, I do see a time compression and I see sort of an increased urgency, but I think we, we've been fortunate enough to still be allowed to, I think there's two aspects of this, still be allowed to have that, that, uh, that, that, that long view. Uh, sorry, I'm just closing the, uh, Paul, I just got up on my screen here. And so I think we, we are still being allowed, we are still getting that air cover, if you will, that, that's one thing, but I think the other interesting aspect is particularly as a lot of what we've invested in, as, as mentioned, is supply chain related. A lot of people talk about supply chains at the moment. How do you change the supply chain? How do you make your supply chain more resilient? And suddenly some of the stuff that three months ago seemed like something that would materialize three, five, seven years down the road, suddenly becomes relevant already now. So I think those are some of the, the big changes I, I really seen in, in, in the recent past. Interesting. And, and just to uh, build on that, uh, what you're saying is that some of the, the needs that you saw as, uh, you know, on the horizon, uh, you know, are much more relevant now. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're focusing on those and your organization's focusing on those more so than they would have like three months ago. I, I, I think so, right? I mean, you know, one of, one of the things that we believe very much in, and I think it sort of also ties in with something that Alan said before, right? That is, you have this, this innovation capability of the startup world, right? And then you have the size and the reach of the corporates. And we fundamentally sort of always believe sort of marrying those two, but also knowing that it's going to take sort of a while for, for, for the sort of pace to pick up and for those two worlds to come together. But now sort of we are seeing these sort of, you know, born digital companies, right? They are much more resilient because they don't sort of solve problems just by throwing more people at it, right? And they don't require that sort of personal interaction. They have the backbone and, and you know, people, you know, working remotely and all of that stuff, right? 
which I think we are just as an organization just learning. I think we are learning fast, but suddenly these models kind of prove themselves faster, or, or let's say they mature faster than I think they otherwise would, just simple out of, of, of pure necessity. Interesting. And Alan, you're focused on building billion dollar businesses um, that don't exist today. That's a, that's a long-term game. Uh, how, how do you think and how does P&G think about balancing uh, the need to build that next billion dollar business with the need to uh, grow more quickly today? So um, as soon as said, you know, certainly the core versus new businesses, you really need to separate those out, right? And it's really important. It's really hard to innovate in new spaces if the core is not healthy. Um, that looks more like a crisis of trying to kind of bail water out of the, uh, out of the sinking ship. Um, we're fortunate that, you know, our core is extremely healthy, um, but we do have a ring fenced organization, right? And that's important. Um, and the organizational structure, you know, Suna talked about air coverage, um, reporting up through the top of a company is quite important in the innovation space, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, an example, if there aren't enough babies being born in the world and, you know, our big mega brand like Pampers is going through some pain, um, that shouldn't affect us, right? We have to continue to innovate on, you know, what you talk about is like Horizon 2 and Horizon 3, um, which for the audience is kind of nurturing new businesses and creating, you know, genuinely new businesses. Um, but with that said, you know, we operate in a very, very lean mentality. And one of our criteria is continuing to learn and move things forward, right? For us, our innovation space is all about kind of consumers and jobs to be done, right? And when you focus on that, right, the, as long as you stay close to what's going on, and again, we can talk about COVID in a minute, um, those jobs are pretty resilient, right? And they're usually broad spaces, so it's not, you know, when we develop a new business or a new brand, it's not a new product. It's a series of products, right? To deliver against this consumer need um, in the startup world, we call it a pain point. And it's truly a pain killer, right? Yep. Um, and for us, you know, we've really sharpened our pencil um, across the company and across P&G Ventures around delivering superior consumer experiences in areas that consumers really care about. Right. And that last part of that sentence is extremely important, especially now. Right. Because we're in such an unprecedented time in society with so much uncertainty. Um, I always say to teams and my pa external partners, you know, today's results are tomorrow's experiments. We are living that today. Right. And people may not like what's on the news and all the puts and calls between economy and health and stuff like that. Um, but this is a real live experiment that's being run around the world. <laughs> and that's very much how innovation works, right? Yeah. You have a kind of a leap of faith of assumption, um, and then you go get data around that and you persevere or pivot or stop, right? Um, but for us, you know, making sure that consumer um, job is really crystal clear helps us then find amazing partners and solutions that will deliver against a potential future business. Got it. And then in terms of any you know, air cover and internal communications with your stakeholders, you mentioned the importance of you know, reporting to the top. Um, any, any recommendations or best practices for managing your stakeholders in this kind of environment uh, where they're very concerned about the core business um, and you're focused adjacent to the core. Um, any recommendations for how to communicate what you're doing, how to uh, um, uh, strengthen the messaging around what you're doing uh, with respect to your stakeholders? So for us, you know, number one is it's really important to understand the role of the organization in kind of the strategic position of the company, right? And Suna probably knows what his role is. We know P&G Ventures role within the larger enterprise. So that's really important. Um, the second one is communication, right? So we are structured very much like a venture organization, although we're not in, per se leading with capital, right? So we have an internal venture board. 
we meet with very regularly, um, reviewing milestones, breaking down barriers, um, making sure you know everybody's on the same page at any given time, right? So that organization and that board, you know, we meet very regularly, right? So we don't have lots of surprises, right? Now in this day and age, you know, it's all about communication, right? And there are short-term bumps and stuff in the road, um, but it's really staying the course, right? And continuing what we've started. Um, you know, P&G Ventures is off to a great start. Um, but you know, we're at base camp one or base camp two. There's a lot of work in front of us. Yeah. Um, and to develop a billion dollar business, um, it takes years, right? That does, just doesn't happen overnight, right? But what are all the signposts that you're continuing to make progress and you're continuing um, to iterate in your learnings? And that's what's most important, right? Is continuing to make progress and being really aware on what is happening in the real world, right? Um, especially now, right? Because what, what needs to be amplified and what maybe needs to be stopped or changed or put on pause. Yeah, and, and Suna, you report directly into the, the CEO. How, how do you, um, you know, manage his, his sort of needs uh, during this uncertain time? I actually don't think that our CEO is, um, is, is the biggest challenge. I think he's been, I think, very, uh, very empowering and very uh, in, entrusting in, you know, in us all the way sort of from, from, from the outset, right? Saying this is important, you know, for, for the long-term prosperity of, of, of Maersk. Uh, he is not asking for the details of what we're doing, but sort of has a firm belief in that A, this is right, and B, we know what we're doing within the team. Um, and, and I'll sort of, and, and this is not necessarily sort of a, a, a COVID uh, learning, um, but the internal venture board that, that Alan describes, you know, um, I don't have that. It hasn't been imposed on me, and I haven't done anything to create it either. Now, that's been great <laughs> up to a certain time because it's sort of given us a lot of decision power and a lot of agility. So you can say our internal venture board is basically composed of team members from my team. So mm -hmm. in case there's a tie, I, 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 can, I can break that tie. Now, I think the stage we are getting into now, and I don't think that's sort of COVID related, uh, but, but those sort of two things seem to, uh, to, to somehow converge in, in, in time is, moving out of that air cover and then creating your own right to exist, if you will, right? So you say, and I think we've been, been fortunate to make some investments where we've had enough foresight. And then you can always argue how much of that was luck and how much of that was, was skill. But where we've had enough foresight to know where the business was going to be in 12 months, 18 months, and some of those bets, if you will, are, are, are now coming home. And, and, um, and again, I, I spoke about this time compression earlier, how sort of COVID suddenly makes certain things more relevant today that they otherwise would have taken one or two or three years to materialize. So I think that that's clearly is, is, is one of the things we see. I think the need for communication um, for us is the level below the CEO and probably also that level below, because, you know, I mean, and, and Alan can probably speak to this as well. I mean, one thing is kind of what, what the CEO wants to happen in an organization. <laughs> and, and, you know, another one is sort of what happens a layer down or two layers yeah. down. The people who have to do the actual work and who have to find the time while still delivering on their scorecard and the business priorities and what they're getting paid their salaries for and getting their bonuses on, right? Um, and, and I think that that's one of the big things here that essentially you know, the people who are working with us, and I'm seeing more and more of our colleagues leaning in, which I think is absolutely fantastic, but they're doing so out of interest, right? This is not 20% of anybody's scorecard. They're mm -hmm. doing this because they find it interesting and they find it engaging, and, and that's why, why our colleagues are, are, are leaning in. Um, so I think the way that we're kind of, you know, trying to communicate, if you will, rather than doing a lot of slideshows and so on is, we're actually trying to invite people in to what we're doing. So 
they can get that and, and also make them part of the successes we are having. Uh, not the failures, just part of the successes. What, what, does, what does inviting them in look like? Is that, uh, you know, uh, like hosting virtual events or uh, involving them in uh, the decision making and validation process? What, what does in, involving those people uh, mean? It's, it's, it's a whole host of, 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 of different things. Everything from, you know, uh, you know, founders talks. And I mean, there's sort of different levels sort of engagement and sort of like touch models, right? I mean, just before COVID hit us uh, in, in, in Denmark, we're actually broadcasting as the only place in Denmark, um, the, the, the documentary about general magic um, mm -hmm. and actually had one of, uh, one of the directors dial in for Q and A. So we had like a full auditorium at Maersk HQ, you know, so, so that's, a, that's a recommendation for all of you out there. Also movie, um, but you know, so that's some of the light touch stuff, right? But then when we, when we invest, for instance, and I think this is the closest degree of, of, of involvement we have, um, we actually reach out to sort of quite a broad group of our stakeholders. And again, as I mentioned briefly, I touched upon briefly, we have, uh, we have a value creation model that we call ABCDE. So this is our non-cash uh, non add or non-cash value creation to the portfolio. Um, now, when we go in and, and start performing due diligence on a company, we do so by inviting external, but primarily internal experts in. And what we essentially tell people is, you know, just so, so we are clear, you are not part of the decision because chances are that this is going to go horribly wrong, right? And careers are not made in corporate by making mistakes, right? You know, people typically make careers in corporates by not taking risks and by not making mistakes, right? We are in a completely different game here. We do take risks and consequently, you know, most of the stuff we touch, you know, is probably going to go south or not really go anywhere. So we say to people, well, we want to hear what you have to say. We want to bring you in. If this becomes a success, you're part of the story. If it becomes a failure, soon as to blame. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the way we sort of actually try to, to do this. But we involve people on a lot of different levels. I mean, now we, we are not as far progressed as Alan and his team is on, on innovation, for instance. I only recently, six, seven months ago, hired an innovation program manager to try to build our innovation muscle within AP Muller Maersk. And, and that's actually one of the things COVID has brought with it. We are now over the last couple of months sitting and saying, wow, you know, how do we actually use this downturn? How do we use the crisis to come out strengthened on the other side? And three months ago, we are having difficulties getting people on board, our innovation initiatives. And now we've got people rushing in because they really see this as an opportunity, right? How do you actually innovate during uncertainty? And I think sort of also on our theme here, that, that's actually, I think, a pretty interesting, uh, interesting observation that we got people coming to us that we couldn't rope in just a few months ago. Hmm. Interesting. Um, oh, I guess so Stu, can I jump in just a couple, couple of points of clarification? So sure. one is, you know, within our organization, you know, we're a learning organization, even, you know, a hundred and 80 year old company, we continue to learn. So I would tell you, number one is our kind of internal venture board, which, you know, through CEO and even, you know, touch points with our board of directors brings amazing experiences, right? People have seen now nobody's seen COVID, but people have seen like almost everything. Right. And our conversations are not reviews. Our conversations very much are working meetings so that we get the best of all the thinking in the room at any given point in time. So that's really important. Um, the other thing, because I've seen some uh, questions pop up is, you know, being associated with a big co, even though we're kind of a ring fenced organization, um, there are amazing gifts that we can borrow from the company. Right. And there is amazing know how. Right. So the way we work is if we can borrow it, we certainly will. Right. Um, we are in a lot of spaces the company's not in today. And that's why we're partnering uniquely with startups and entrepreneurs, because they bring a tremendous amount of value beyond just speed. 
um, especially as we're looking at creating new businesses that we want to be grounded in science. We want to be grounded in things that will deliver against these jobs or pain points in a superiority, in a superior way that we can innovate year on year with, right? And those, um, those collaborations are pretty unique where we bring a lot of capability around, you know, brand building, consumer insight, manufacturing, supply chain, regulatory, communication, design, right? Those are a lot of things that are really heavy lifting for small companies and entrepreneurs where we can add tremendous value. And a lot of it is around creating mutual value together to serve the consumer's needs. Yeah. And I think in this environment, especially being a helpful and a uh, collaborative partner is a, is a huge you know, differentiator. I think that uh, you know, many uh, corporates fail to deliver on the promised value uh, to the startups they invest in. And, and so how, how do your organizations ensure that you can deliver on your promise? And, and is it through shared resources with the, with the parent organization? Um, how, how does that how is that promise delivered on? So we have, you know, within P&G Ventures, we have dedicated resources. We are truly in service of entrepreneurs, right? So as we look at our innovation program, you know, um, quite a bit is from the external. Quite a bit is from partnerships. Some is from internal capability and internal technologies that we've delivered against um, over the years and capabilities. Um, we have fully dedicated teams, right? But they're small, lean teams. Right. So when we collaborate and start to learn, um, and again, it's about learning. It's not about a big agreement yet. It's how do we learn together? How do we create value together? And how do we assure that we're all creating value and we're all contributing? It's not is Proctor contributing or what can we get from the startup? It's both of us. Right. Um, being very milestone based. Right. Again, borrowing from the venture community, how you do that. Um, is really important. Um, and then, you know, even how we think about funding programs and what's needed from um, a capital standpoint, again, very metered funding. Um, but for us, it's more how do we leverage um, kind of, I like to call them the gifts that the company can bring to the table, right, to really deliver against these consumer pain points with our partners. Right. And, and Suna, I know you've, you spent a lot of time designing uh, a system to deliver the value that Maersk's assets can deliver. Can you talk a little bit about uh, delivering promise value? Yeah, and I mean it's it, it's based on, uh, on 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 that 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 premise that Alan laid out initially, right? That you know, capital really isn't slash wasn't a, a, a differentiator, right? And when we decided that we're going to start venture investing, and this is sort of a you know, after sort of trying to figure out where could we add value and trying some things out during 2017, sort of at the end of 17, we said, okay, let, we want to start investing in startups um, at, to accelerate our, 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 our journey and, and, and leapfrog some of, some of the, the, the steps. And as part of that, we sat down and we spoke with a lot of pure play VCs, a lot of corporate VCs, and also a lot of startups to understand why corporate or strategic venture capital has a bum rep, which I think, you know, it's fair to say that, that, that it, it, it does, right? There's some people who do it excellently, but I think on average, you know, I, I'm not convinced that, that most corporates got it right. Uh, there are some that have been hugely successful, but certainly also some who sort of go out and, and you know, oh, well, now, you know, we are brilliant VCs and, and then they end up burning a lot of money and, and, and you know, kind of end up being exactly the opposite of smart money, right? And I think there's some, some empirical evidence in that in terms of valuations and, and what have you. But we sort of sat down and said, okay, so what, what are actually the issues? And there's some structural issues that I spoke about before, and I'm not going to bore you with, 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 with those, but about that whole, you know, the whole agility and, and you know, the, the governance and all of that stuff, which is why sort of we are set up on the side. And, and so we have all of that speed. But I think actually the most interesting thing is this thing about all these, let's say, broken promises or some kind of miscommunication where there's a certain expectation on the startup side of what the corporate will bring and it just never materializes, right? And I mean, there's a whole long, long list of, 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 of stories of disappointment when it comes to that, right? So we sat down, okay, we want to be exactly the opposite. 
Now, we've taken a slightly different path than, than, uh, than the PNG Ventures team has and, and with Alan's team. So we, are, we have, let's say, a sizable value creation model, but we are not self-sustained in any way. So the, the, the value creation team, we have uh, management and strategy consultants who are extremely strong on process. So they are essentially sort of the brokers or the go, the in-betweens between the startup and the corporate to make sure that those two gel. Mm -hmm. um, so when, you know, sort of very, very briefly, again, our, our value creation model, we call it ABCDE. So this is assets, brands, customers, data, and expertise. And so essentially unleashing the power and the reach of Maersk so the startups can benefit from that. And that, as Alan also said, comes in a lot of different variations, a lot of different permutations, and it starts sort of with the startup's need. So already before we invest, when we start the early stages of due diligence, we sit down and we together with the startup try to build a hypothesis around what are their problems, sort of what is their top five, 10 problems? How do we believe together that, or which ones of these do we believe we can address? And then we actually end up making a service level agreement with the company where we're saying, okay, out of these seven, you know, pain points you have, we believe we can address three. We jointly believe we can address three and here's what we're going to do about it. Right? So the moment the money is transferred and it's in the bank account, then our uh, value creation team gets to work. And, and again, we built this, this hypothesis together very often with our colleagues from the core business. And then we sort of do a kickoff, where our team goes in, helps with the process, links them up with the various MERSC actors, and then we, we actually get to work, kind of run this almost as a project, right? And we've done everything from launching commercial projects together with some of our investments. We also, by the way, in addition to the investments, we also do a lot of partnerships where there's sort of no, there's no cash trading hands, at least sort of not initially, but where it's sort of, you know, a, a proof of concept or, or, or whatever it is, right? So, that's essentially what we do, this sort of ABCDE model and quite some strict governance around that. But, but we don't, within our team, have the capabilities that Alan has within his team. So I kind of have to go and, and find a stakeholder, several stakeholders who buy into this. The good news, of course, about that is that the moment I can actually get somebody to lean in, then it's much more likely that I'll get a commercial success as well. You know, and we do, we do very similar, right? Like what are, what are the problems we're trying to solve initially and how do we learn together? Um, you know, things you got to, for number one, you have to really have the best interest of your partner at hand. You got to really set up a win-win. Um, Cause the minute, like the minute you screw a partner, trust me, the startup community globally is tiny and they're going to hear what happens on the other side of the world. Okay, so you got to really treat people with utmost respect. Um, not everybody's going to be able to do everything, but it's understanding what everybody can do and bring to the table, even if you need to bring a third party to the table. Um, and then chunking out the work in small bites, right? To both give you confidence, continue to learn, provide um, value for your organization and the startup because if things don't go forward and let's face it the majority don't right i mean it's really hard to create new businesses but when they don't go forward and you part ways you always want to part ways in a really really great way because it comes back around again right and you know we certainly want to be better off and we want our partners to be better off by the experience of working together um, so that's a really important part of it. Yeah. Right. And, and we have, we have quote, you know, you could use the word maybe relationship managers, right. But there's a few of us that really nurture those relationships along um, making sure it's really clear, you know, what that chunk of work is that we're all trying to do, making sure you deliver on your side that you can control the resources and then what the partner can. And in this COVID environment, um, it's even more important right? You know, because you can only control what you can control right now. There are certain things you cannot control. And those things you can't control, you shouldn't be burning time and money on, right? Sometimes you do need to pause for a minute. Um, but at the same time, it's staying extremely close with what's going on, right? So I can tell you pre-COVID, 
you know, consumers are like, huh, naturals versus, you know, hardcore chemistries. Well, I don't think anybody's willing to trade that off right now, yeah. right? Hey, you go down the shopping aisle, right? What are the products left on the aisle? They're the natural products they seem to be. The ones that maybe don't quite deliver that superiority that some of the, you know, tried and trusted brands do. Right. And then and you can go through and understand kind of consumers needs. You know, the first three weeks of this crisis we were all in, all we cared about was disinfecting our homes. Hmm. Right. And our own security and safety. Uh, guess what? All of a sudden, everybody's talking about hair dyeing and haircuts. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, just as you stay involved and as you um, continue to really stay close to what's going on, it doesn't mean disinfection is not important still to everybody. It's important to all of us, right? But our needs continue to evolve in this environment. Um, and you just gotta, you just gotta be really guided and stay close with the consumers, whoever the consumer is, whether it's a, you know, a B to C, a B to B, whoever your end um, consumer is, and then bringing the partners along in a very, um, a very metered and tiered way. Right, because we all have big aspirational goals, um, but boy, don't get lost in the woods right now. We don't need people being lost in the woods or lost on the mountain, right? We need a lot of Sherpas and a lot of guides helping people through this. Right, and then, and Suna, just to clarify your answer earlier on the the value creation team, those consultants are internal Maersk uh, employees who are responsible for. Uh, creating the relationships between your investments and other parts of the organization, or are they external consultants like McKinsey or BCG or Bain? No, so they, they are they are you know employed by by by, by our team. Um, have a lot of a mix of experience. Some from the outside, some from from the inside. We also have have our own. The the person who leads the team is actually a hire from our own. We have an an in house uh, management consulting company. Uh, so, so we hired the, 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 the lead of that team actually from, from that. So somebody who knows consulting and knows, uh, knows the business, right? And it's sort of really sort of linking these two up, sort of that external world, you know, with what's happening out there, what's the, you know, cutting edge business models, technologies, and so on with that, that internal reach and knowledge of Maersk and what are the priorities, what are the strategies, what's, what's interesting and, and, and what's not interesting. And then I think just a big thing is actually, you know, I think that, that we know that, that things sort of revolve at a very, very different pace in, in startup land as compared to corporate land, right? You know, that, you know, uh, you know three months, uh, you know, is, is an eternity when, when, when you're in a startup. And, and you know, in, in a corporate, that's just the time between scheduling two meetings, right? And, and, um, and, and I think what's often happened, and I don't think there's any sort of, there's no good people or bad people in this, but it's, it's very different worlds, right? So, we often see these two worlds, I wouldn't say they don't clash, but they don't really jive. And, and I mean, I think one of the things that, that one of the discussions I've had to have many, many times with, with colleagues, and again, well-meaning colleagues, colleagues, brilliant colleagues, really, really good at their jobs, but this whole thing saying, you know, but why would we want to own 10% of that company? Why don't we just buy the whole thing? You know, and, and, and which of course is, you know, and, and we want control or, I've had cases where a couple of the companies we are we invested in saying, you know, you know, have them give, we, we want their algorithm, make them give us their algorithm. It's like, but, but, but guys, right? And, and of course, it's, it's, it's well-meaning, right? But, but it's just, it's, it's different worlds. And, and so I think it's just that, that whole translation, right? And of course, it, it, goes, it, it goes both ways. Um, so I think that's a big part of, of what we are doing, actually getting people to the table, right? Um, and when we finally get people in the same room, right, I mean, then, then magic happens and, and people work exceptionally well together, much, much better than I could expect. And they get excited and build on each other and all of that stuff, right? And, and then, of course, the last little thing I say about this, of course, what's very important for our team is that we manage to maintain Chinese walls, um, which can sometimes be a, be, a, be a difficult balance, right? So a couple of times there is, let's say, a pure commercial transaction saying Maersk is now a client of one of our portfolio companies and we'll bring people to the table, but then we'll step away to make sure that we don't end up sort of getting, 
you know, falling on either side of the, uh, of the fence in, uh, in, in this. But I must say, I mean, so far, so good. I, I've been, I've actually been very, very positively surprised about how, how, how seamless, if you will, how this is actually happening now. Yeah. Wasn't the case two years ago, but today that, that actually works incredibly well. Yeah. Can we talk yeah. a little bit about what do on this, you know, and it's, it's most important to have the right skill sets at the table for whatever you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And if they're internal skills, great. Right. If the partner brings the skills, great. At times we'll tap into third parties, right. To get that right skills so that you can really make that right decision or the best decision with the data you have in hand. Right. Cause there's no corporation that knows everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk a little bit about, um, Given that both your efforts are focused on identifying great entrepreneurs and partnering with them, uh, and in this environment, um, it's very difficult to, or impossible, to meet with them uh, IRL. Um, and so, so what, what, and at the same time, you don't see your teams, um, you know, IRL. And so, what have you done to ensure that, um, you know, not seeing someone face to face uh, isn't disruptive to you and your teams. So it is disruptive and it is different, um, but you know, it's reality. It's just where we live today, right? So, you know, we stay extremely close right now with like everybody, right? So, you know, most of us are popping on Zoom calls or team calls at seven o'clock in the morning and we're done at like nine o'clock at night. Um, and it, it's a constant effort. Um, the good news is, you know, based on, you know, my and our networks, um, we're continuing to build, right? And we're continuing to build relationships, build our networks, um, build on the, um, the partnerships we have, and importantly, establish a lot of new partnerships. You know, one of the things I try to do, Stu, is because I do a lot of work uh, on the West Coast, right? So in the evenings, twice a week, I try to have, quote, a virtual glass of wine with somebody, because that's a big part of what you do when you're out and about, boots on the ground. Right. Serendipity is a part of our jobs. It's hard to put that in a strategy document, but it just is. And more often than not, if I'm having a glass of wine with you, all of a sudden, you know, and again, it's virtual on Teams or Zoom or whatever, all of a sudden, you know, Suna pops in and I'm like, who is this person? Oh, Stu invited me and thought he would be, be a really good conversation. And it's very much like um, the real world all of a sudden, Yeah. right? So I think we're adapting, right? Will it replace in-person serendipity conversations, you know, leads and phone calls? No, um, but are we getting by? Absolutely, right? And it's just a matter of pivoting and being agile. Yep. Yeah, and, and <laughs> well, and, and yes, it's, it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for, for us uh, to meet, uh, Alan. So, so I, I must say, I still haven't found sort of the, uh, the the virtual version of uh, of uh, of Cougar Night at the Rosewood in Palo Alto, but uh, um, <laughs> but but that aside, I, I think all right, inside joke. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we we spoke a uh, we, we spoke a bit about it just just before opening up uh, up the call here to everybody, right? But you know, I I've been been fortunate enough that in in, in Denmark we. Uh, we sort of managed to 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 break the curve uh, at least sort of the first wave of it a little bit uh, a little bit earlier. So my team has actually been back in uh, in the office for the last two and a half weeks now. So we we are sort of fortunate enough that we have a relatively large office space. So so we have have all hands on deck here, sort of with social distancing and uh, some precautions. But but you know, essentially my team is back in the office. Um, we are sort of separated for about six weeks. Um, I think we actually just earlier this week, just on that internal piece first, had a, had a, uh, you know, we did a survey and had a, a follow-up meeting with the team saying, what are the things that we actually learned from the lockdown that we can replicate now that we are back in the office? Um, because we suddenly found that, you know, we are doing Friday quizzes and stuff like that, getting to know each other better and so on, when, which is stuff you don't, 
don't, at least in our team, don't normally think about in the same way when you're kind of all stuck in the salt mine, right? So, so I think we, we found a way actually to do some of these things. And I'll take some of these learnings that we had from the lockdown, trying to bring them into the physical office space. Now, that's the, the internal piece. I think on, when it comes to sort of deal flow partnerships, I think we had, we came into this with quite a strong momentum. So the deals we have just been closing, for instance, the last couple of weeks or the last month here, are actually people that we have met with. Mm -hmm. Now, I can see the last couple of weeks, our deal flow is beginning to, to come down. We still see a lot of stuff and we're still thinking about how we can, how we can go about that. But I think you, you, you said something very important, Alan, right? I mean, it is serendipity, right? And, and you meet this person or you find yourself in this bar, you bump into somebody, you know, and, and, and that whole sort of thing is, you know, self-fueling somehow, right? And I think that, that I, I'm personally finding difficult to replicate. Uh, I'm also essentially have pulled uh, a list of, of everybody I met with the last 18 months and have then, you know, started catching up with them because, you know, I, I similar to you, you know, I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark, but the way that we have, we have uh, geographically segmented, uh, you know, I'm responsible for the U.S., right? So every evening, typically, I have calls catching up with, with, with old friends and so on. I, I must say that personally, I find it difficult to make new friends in the current environment, at least at the same pace as I was able to before. Um, and, and, but, but maybe that's just the way that, that, that I go about it. I have not met as many new people the last two months as I had the two months before. Interesting. Um, and I'd agree, though I'm meeting a lot of new people. It's not quite, you know, normally at any given month, you know, we'll, we'll look at 100 to 120 opportunities. Um, we're not quite at that level, um, but I'm meeting quite a bit. I think the other thing that's really important, because again, everybody in the world's at a different part of this current journey, um, or soon as all back in the office, um, you know, it takes discipline, right? Working from home is not easy, right? Because it's a spectrum, because you have other responsibilities or, Oh, by the way, you could also work 18 hours a day. Yep. Right? That's not healthy either, right? Because um, I think, you know, all of us being very mindful of, you know, everybody's needs and, and, and it's all okay and everybody's a little different, right? Um, and it's just really understanding. There are a couple of really great articles out there um, that have been published. Um, you know, the former CEO of LinkedIn published a great article about work from home. These are really, they're good, they're good reads, right? Because I think moving forward, there's a lot we can take forward, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of efficiencies of, you know, how we can do things different and things we need to kind of elevate and really make sure we double down on. Yep. How do you think, uh, maybe, and I know we're uh, close to the end here, um, so uh, one or two more questions. Um, how do you think, if at all, your definition of success changes as a result of this uh, pandemic? Our mission's still the same. Build billion dollar businesses for, you know, delivering superiority for consumers and our shareholders. You know, that, that's, that continues to be the same, same theme. And, and I'm also, I, I think that the one thing I've spoken about it a bit earlier, I, I think that may change is that I think we might know earlier, uh, you know, if I'm being a little bit optimistic, we might even confirm earlier that we are a success or we can be part of creating successes, right? You know, historically, I've been talking about three to seven year timelines. Now, again, as I mentioned, I actually see things materializing here now. Hmm. And that's not the organization asking you to accelerate your timelines. It's more so that things you saw on the horizon have been brought forward by uh, new consumer demand. Yes. Hmm. Supply chain. I think, it's, I think it's also important. I saw some of the notes around funding drying up and you know, that's not going to happen. It's going to shift. Right. And I just think staying relevant 
you know, there's still going to be capital out there. There's still going to be corporates that want to collaborate. Um, certainly we do. I think, you know, Suna will continue to do that. Um, I think you just need to be mindful of kind of what you're going after and what your business is and don't be afraid to pivot, right? And continue to maintain control of what you can control. You can't control certain things right now, right? Yep. And so Agreed. how about building on that as a last question uh, for both of you, what, what areas are you more excited about now than you were three months ago? Well, I mean, I think sort of the easy answer for me is, 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 is supply chain resilience. And that, that's a lot of different things. That's probably stuff that people didn't really sort of care too much about sort of before, right? That is not, it's not necessarily lowest cost anymore, right? It's, it's the resilience, it's the agility and the adaptability. Um, and, and I think that has implications on, on the entire supply chain universe. Um, so that I, I think is, is the big one to me. That conversation is a hell of a lot easier to have today than six months ago. Yeah, and I mean, for us and for me, I mean, it's, it's really has emphasized how superiority is so important, right? As far as superior experiences, benefits, performance. Um, yep. It is so important for consumers now. And, you know, and that's part of, um, part of our strategy um, across all vectors, right? Um, and I think that continues to be play out, right? And we'll see over time. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, consumers want reassurance. Um, I think consumers at the end of the day want trusted brands. Um, and I think that's going to be a big shift of the landscape um, where a lot of these like no name direct to consumer brands, maybe they don't have superiority, maybe they're me too. I think it's all, all shifting a bit, yeah. right? And where it ends up landing, it's unclear, right? Because we're not on the other side of this. Right. Trust me, we are still on, you know, the middle of this whole thing. And the next, you know, X months are going to make a real difference in how this thing all shakes out and consumer sentiment and how businesses evolve, how we interact with each other. Um, all I can tell you is things will continue to move forward. Right. Yeah, and embrace the change. That's the only thing that we can be sure of is there's going to be change. Amazing. Well, uh, Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Suna, and thank everybody who uh, attended. Um, as I noted earlier, I'll share a recording of this webinar, uh, as well as the results from our uh, poll. Uh, please keep an eye out for our next uh, webinar, uh, which I mentioned will be on startup and technology mergers and acquisitions. Um, and if there are things that you're interested in, um, please email me at Stu, S-T-U at Radical Insights. And, you know, perhaps we'll put together an event on uh, that. Um, awesome, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice uh, afternoon. And uh, thank you all again. Thanks. Everybody stay safe out there. Thank you all. Take care.